In Hebrews 11, in that great Hall of Fame chapter of faith, reading about the worthies of old who never knew the church, never knew the New Testament, we come down to Moses, who had an exemplary faith, and we find in verse 27 these words regarding Moses. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. I want to zero in on he endured. What an eventful life, to say the least, that Moses had in service to God. What he did, he did by the authority of God. And he kept at it. If you think of one enduring, then the very nature and meaning of the word endure causes us to think of one facing opposition or some kind of difficulties. Well, when you think of Moses... A good man who served God faithfully in his time on earth. And assuredly, this was the case with him. It was not easy at all for him. And it's not easy for any person who seeks to do the will of God. It is ridiculous to try to convert people. Think of the meaning of the word convert. And yet try to get them to think that, well, there's no big deal to it. Well, then why do you have Moses as a great example? And yet it says he endured. Well, the easiest way to say that is that no matter what happened to him, he kept on doing what God called him to. And thus a great lesson is here. And can we find some of the things from this study that he endured? Can we measure the man, the quality of the man, spiritual quality, by what he faced? Can we also see what it cost him personally to be faithful to God? And I think that we can. So let's look at this for a little while We're under the idea of Moses enduring, keeping on, keeping on. You'll remember that when Moses went to Egypt, he was to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. Well, he raised the question in Exodus 5-2, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? That is, that was Pharaoh that raised that question. Well, this man who sat on the throne of one of the greatest nations in the world at that time had no respect or regard at all for God, the God who Moses served. He showed nothing but contempt for the commands of God. He simply was not a believer in God. And frankly, he could not see why others believed in God. And in his view of deity, he thought of himself, no doubt, as much of a God as any other God. Now, this can have its effect in the hearts of minds of people today. You, as a young person, might find yourself in a classroom especially in higher education, but nowadays it could be any time in a classroom, surrounded with atheistic, secular-thinking people. And they will find such folks do not believe in God. Many of those they are around will deny the very existence of God. In fact, they will challenge the Bible itself. Well, what is that young person to do? 
He hears the Bible challenged as the Word of God. He, he sees it mocked. What is his reaction to be? Well, I think the same attitude is to be present at that time as it was in Moses' mind. There's no surrender of his faith. No surrender of his faith just because men like Pharaoh didn't believe what he had to say. A lot of people do that. I can tell you in my time, and it's probably not nearly as bad then as it is today, that in secular schools you will, if you're going to practice Christianity from day to day, run into situations like this. He knew what God had said. There's no doubt about that. And that was enough for him. He knew there was a God. There was only one true and living God. The gods of Egypt were no gods. Yeah, you could safely say he knew God. And he knew God had sent him on a mission. He knew he wasn't there just because he wanted to be there. God called him and God sent him. He had Aaron, his brother, to help him. And now they were prepared to endure whatever Pharaoh had to put up against them. So you see, it starts off by knowing God, by acting only by the authority of God, to being determined to hold to that authority because you know God will never desert you, that he will supply you with the wherewithal to be able to meet whatever slings and arrows that Satan has to throw at you. But it takes that attitude of the heart. The late Brother Bill Jackson used to call it a stubborn faith. It says when you know that you know you're right, and today that would be as the Bible defines the right, you don't move off of it. Make anybody, make any difference what anybody else says. And he endured not only the contempt of the ruler, but he endured in spite of complaints. Complaints have a way of just wearing you down when they come all the time from the same people especially. You don't have to go far with Moses and the children of Israel into the wilderness before he is bombarded by one complaint after another. And all of this was in spite of the things that God had done for them. And they had witnessed it. They had seen it. God didn't leave them alone. They had been brought out of Egypt, as the scripture says, with a strong arm. That is proving God was behind it all. Knowing they couldn't have gotten out without his help. And they had seen so many wondrous things in the plagues of Egypt actually are directed against the false gods of Egypt. But they still complained. These aren't just necessarily saying, I'm tired of walking, my feet hurt. That's not that kind of complaint. It's actually complaining against God as if he didn't know what he was doing. That's the reason it's so terrible. Sometimes I think we think of murmuring and complaining and it's sort of like, well, you know, I worked too much yesterday and I don't really feel like putting myself back into it today and my muscles hurt and whatever. It's not that kind of complaining. It's, it's charging God that why are we here? Why did we listen in the first place? Why are we following this Moses? Who knows what's happened to him? Yet they knew God had called him. They had all like a need they nevertheless complained. And you can read over in Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3. We might just turn there and look at that for a minute. 2 through 3, Exodus 16, 2 through 3. And we can see some of that. Exodus 16, verse 2. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and elders in the wilderness. Notice the whole congregation. 
And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for we have brought us forth, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. That's the kind of thing he endured. Yet he was there because God put him there. He knew God was with him. But he had to endure these complaints. Then we see that Moses endured in spite of criticism. You know, this man was no more immune to criticism than any other man. I don't know why we look at these people and think they never faced what we face. Any man that's placed in a position of leadership and a place of responsibility is going to face criticism, just or unjust criticism. And you can find, we won't read it now, you can find this happening in Numbers 12, verses 1 and 2. Just jot that down, go back and see the kind of criticism launched against Moses because he was doing what God called him to do. So the question is not, will one be criticized? Just face it, that's going to happen. The question is, how will I react when such comes? Well, we know how it happened in the case of this man Moses. The scripture says in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3 that he was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. My, what a mouthful. <laughs> Imagine that. Meekness is not a sign of weakness. Meekness means I know what the properly constituted authority is, and I'm going to obey it, let come what may. That is the root and the ground of enduring. So that said about the character of Moses. As I've said many times, I don't know how I could have put up with all that the children of Israel did as long as Moses did. So he had his feelings under control. He was a sober-minded man. He thought through a thing. He was not reactionary. It means he could keep his balance in some very difficult and trying circumstances and situations. And that reminds us again of the value of the Old Testament as we labor to obey Christ under the authority of the new, that they were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. When later others accused Moses as if he was taking too much on himself, and that's what, he, what was said, you can see one of the great cases to where he exercised self-control. He wouldn't allow himself to make matters worse than they already were. Sometimes that's hard to do. He permitted the Lord to take care of the matter in his own way. You can see this in other great characters of the Old Testament, such as David. Saul had been rejected as king. David had been anointed as king. He could have taken Saul's life, but he would not do it. He even showed Saul that he could have, but he didn't. He let God take care of that. And many times that's how you handle criticism. Doesn't mean that you can never answer where you're being unjustly criticized. And it may be very hard sometimes to accept criticism when you see there's truth even in the criticism your enemies launch against you. They may not, but they may not desire for you to benefit from it. They may want to just cut you down. But if there's some truth to it, then there's something you can do for yourself in learning from it. He endured all of this which means we can because that's one reason that is taught in the scriptures. There is no greater 
study, at least I don't think, than the study of Moses. Going back to Hebrews 11, I just picked out that one thing there. Verse 27, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Or we'll look at the latter part of seeing him who is invisible. Now that sounds like a contradiction of terms. How do you see what can't be seen? Seeing him who is invisible. Well, we can. Every one of us, if you're faithful to Jesus Christ, sees him who is invisible. Oh, we don't see a shape. But we see the truth. We see the Word of God. We understand the meaning of the Word of God. We have studies like this where we can see that God didn't forsake Him. And thus we're able by the, as the old saying goes, the eye of faith to see God and see the blessings of God and know that He will not leave us, that He will not forsake us. And that's a very important point to keep in mind. Looking even further, we'll back up now and look at it, to verse 23. The point I want to make is what's made all through this chapter, by faith. Well, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So if they're acting by faith, they understand the will of God. They're basing their actions upon doing what God said do. And notice, by faith, Moses, uh, when he was born was hid three months by his parents. Well, that's not talking about Moses' faith. That's telling you what kind of parents he had. And it says because, the reasons given. They, there's the one that exercised the faith, his parents, they saw he was a proper child. And then here's the key that we need to see. It tells you the kind of parents he had. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now it was his mother that was chosen to be his nurse once the daughter of Pharaoh had found him. Thus his mother would have instructed him and taught him all about his people. And notice verse 24, by faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So by the word of God, Moses, when he was come to years, refused. It was an act of his own will. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We don't realize, really, just what he gave up by his own choice. But it was tremendous, tremendous what he gave up. And it was all according to the Word of God, acting upon it. He had to learn it from somewhere. And it would be like Timothy learning it from his grandmother and mother as to what's right and wrong and how he ought to live and who he was. Now that was 40 years that he lived in that condition. 40 years is a long time in anybody's book. Then he left, and we won't go through all the details of why, he left Egypt. And he spent 40 more long years. Now think of the difference in how he spent that second part of his life from the first part of his life he was in regal splendor glory and power and might in the first part obtained a great education go back and read Stephen's sermon regarding how he was educated and all the wisdom of the Egyptians he had the best education you could get and now he ends up going down into the wilderness he goes and lives a nomadic life. He's a shepherd. And yet that had its place. He could think. He was out by himself with the sheep. Totally different from what he had in Egypt. How did that add to his life? Well, it taught him to contemplate, to meditate. I just wonder how many times he prayed to God while he was there. Well, 40 years passed. Burning bush comes along. God speaks to him, gives him the commission, told him what road to go on back to Pharaoh. And so there he was, 80 years old. Sounded like to me somebody should have retired. 80 years old, and God says, now you're ready for the whole reason I've raised you up anyway. 
And it was going to be the toughest time of his whole existence. Because that's what we just started reading about. He endured. And now he had all these people he came to help, and they're on his case. Notice, esteeming reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. That tells us more of why he left Egypt. But then, how he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover. That means the word of God came to him and he kept the word of God and the sprinkling of blood lest it, he that destroyed the firstborn would touch him. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. And then of course as Joshua took over and they went into the land of promise Jericho was brought up. But the key is they walked and lived as the word of God instructed them. Now, really, it's quite simple, isn't it? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That, that's demonstrated in Moses' life. So whatever came upon him, the way of privation and hurt and persecution because he obeyed God, he just kept obeying God. See, those things didn't change the word of God. It didn't make any difference what happened to him that was bad because he obeyed God. Those things happening to him didn't change a thing, so he endured. It's all a part of the plan. It's all a part of what's involved. So it is that when you come to the New Testament, you find the teaching of Christ, take up your cross and daily follow me. We don't have the same burden to bear that Christ had in order to accomplish what he did that we couldn't to save us from our sins. But we're members of, of the church and as Peter said he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps and we should suffer as he suffered because Moses was a type of Christ and so it is we have the example of Christ for us to follow the church is very precious to God which means every member of the church is because his own son purchased it with his blood he gave his life for it we ought to have that same love of one another and appreciation of one another because each one of us as members of the church have had the blood applied when we were baptized into Christ we were baptized into his death each one of us has heard the same gospel thus there ought to be encouragement from one to the other as a part of our fellowship to help us endure. It's easy just to hit and miss or do something for a little while and then back off. But the Christian keeps on day in and day out. And the Lord tells you how to deal with it. Just take on one day at a time. Don't try to take it on all at once. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You stay faithful today. That's all you got to do. Tomorrow, someday it won't come for any one of us. So if you've made it through the day, faithful, you're ready for eternity. And when you go to bed at night, you utter your prayers, fine. Makes no difference where your heart quits during the night or whatever it is. You're ready to step into eternity. And you have a peace that the world doesn't know. The world can't know. The world is anxious, trying its best to get ready for whatever the world has to offer the next day. People will go to bed tonight, and they'll be thinking about Monday morning. They'll be thinking about this, that, and the other on the job, or I have to get this completed, or I have this assignment and this task, and I've got to do that. And they will die tonight and never see tomorrow. And it's like the rich, foolish farmer who had such a blessing from God that he had such bounty. Well, I don't have enough barns, so I'll build greater barns, all this. And God's watching the whole thing because he knows all things. He says, now, fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things be?
As far as I'm concerned, that sets the tenor of how we should look at everything. Whatever we get, much or small, we use it in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. So if God says, well, it's time for you to come home tonight, this afternoon, fine. I've been living this day like the New Testament said. I've endured whatever it is Satan's thrown my way because whatever he throws my way doesn't change what I knew the Bible to teach in the first place. And I just keep on keeping on, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't you think that pretty well describes Moses in his day and time? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's all he did was do the Lord's will. Whatever it is, wherever we are in the station that God's placed us, then be faithful there. Do what God said. And you'll always have the peace that passes all understanding. And you'll always be ready for eternity. You're not going to be flawless in this life. By that I mean there will always be something you can work on as to your thinking, as to what you're doing. That's part of living in the flesh. But if you're walking faithful, then like Moses of old, you'll be ready for whatever there is there is to come Satan can't reach you if you'll hold God's unchanging hand of divine truth and not be separated from it what people are and what they are not and what we think they are but what they turn out to be so how does that change the Bible it may affect you in the sense of well I won't put in much confidence there as I once did but it doesn't change the Bible so as I close this brief message this afternoon, I want us to keep in mind again what he said in verse 27 concerning Moses. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now do you see him who's invisible? If you don't, then you don't have the proper knowledge of the Bible and confidence in it because it's God's Word, and that's how you understand God. You want to understand God? Understand His Word. If you want to be what you ought to be on earth, when you learn that Word, you put it into practice, and you don't ever let anybody, husband, wife, son, or daughter, mother, daddy, neighbor, best friend, whatever, move you off from it. You endure, and you stay with it, and the reward is yours. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we urge you to seriously consider that. To become a Christian, you must believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sins. When you do that, the Lord will add you to the church, others who've done likewise, and there you can serve Him faithfully. You can endure until time is no more. As a child of God, have you been enduring? Are you bearing up under? Or are you maybe giving up and sit down on the side of the road? That wouldn't be following in the footsteps of Moses, would it? And he was a type of Christ, and thus we wouldn't be following in the footsteps of Christ. So if you need to repent of sins and confess them and pray God for forgiveness, choose this time to do it. Always remembering as long as time goes on on this earth, we have time to change, to obey God. So don't spurn it and don't let it slip by. So if you need to obey the truth, we ask you to come while we stand, while we sing.